So let's pray. Gracious Lord, we are grateful to be here today. It is December. We are moving through Advent and coming ever closer to, um, to Christmas Day, the day we celebrate and remember and, and express the joy over your um, willingness to become one of us, to become incarnate, this, this unimaginable expression of your love and your relentless pursuit of the people that you have created. Um, fill us today with lots of wisdom as we come to the story of David's final days. Um, this, this, is, this is the story of your people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So let me start the podcast up. That'll take me a second. All right. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, we're almost there. Okay, I think we're there. All right, so is there anything today that you would like to talk about before we get started? Theological, biblical, go longhorns, anything? It's fun. It's fun. Okay, well, then here's where we are. We have completed the book of Samuel, right? Samuel is one book in two parts. Um, in the Jewish Bible, it is only one book, the book of Samuel. It's only in the Christian Bible that it is two books, First and Second Samuel, the same as the case for the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles. And we had decided a long time ago that we were going to stay with David into the book First Kings. So that's where we're going to start. We're going to start with First Kings today, and we're going to carry this story. Now, it is... Um, through the first couple chapters of First Kings, and then we will uh, leave it, and we're going to go to the book of Acts. One time in the past, I did Samuel and Kings back to back. It was just a bit much, so it's better to kind of split them up and then come back to Kings, because Kings is a very, very long book. Interesting, lots of, lots of things in there, very theological. All the books really are. So open your Bibles. Two, First Kings, verse one, and I'm going to explain a few things together to you as we go along. And I don't want to do it in like an introduction thing. Um, this is this is the Book of Kings. The probably almost certainly different writers than in the Book of Samuel. Maybe some of the same editors and compilers. We don't really know. You can't know that. It's still written more like Samuel and less like Chronicles. Chronicles is clearly, it's almost like a, like a ledger in some portions of it. So, um, but still very theological because that's, that's really the point here in, in across the Bible is to help us to know God better and to know ourselves better. So chapter 1, verse 1. Am I really all good here? Everybody can hear me? Okay, when King David was very old, he could not keep warm even when they put covers over him. Now that sentence is not just filling you in on the latest physical exam of King David or his age for his age's sake. What is it it is introducing you to is the fact that as the king of Israel, David is failing. Not as king, but as he fails physically and becomes more frail, it creates a crisis of leadership. A crisis of leadership because he is the leader of these 12 tribes. He is the chief warrior. He is someone that they all look to for strength and endurance and as he fails it creates a, a crisis okay in the kingship 
So that's, that's what that sentence is meant to tell you. So, so his attendant said to him, well, let us look for a young virgin to serve the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord the king may keep warm. So there, this idea that they have, I know, I know, I've done this before, I am a veteran, okay, yes. I haven't done this before, I've read this. I, Patty's pointing out, I meant that I have taken people through First Kings. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. So, so their idea, right, because um, they're going to find this young woman who will attend to his needs, lay with him, keep him warm at night. So they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful young woman, and they found a young woman named Abishag, a Shunammite. Let me just explain the word Shunammite, because all Shunammite is, you know, if, if, if you're from Dallas, you're what? A Dallasite. That's all those are. Those occur all the time in, in the Bible. These little names like Shunammite or this or that or whatever, they're all just telling the town they're from, right? So, so she's the Shunammite. She's from the town of Shunam, okay? She's the Shunammite. And they brought this young woman to the king. Now, Abishag was very, very beautiful. She took care of the king, and she waited on him. But the king had no sexual relations with her. So he, in his, what? Right here, end of verse 4. Does it not say that? Yeah, I mean, I'm not making this up. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the, 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 the thing about the Bible is, even more so in the Hebrew, is that it is very direct. It is very honest. You know, there's a lot of places where the English translators kind of, you know, cleaned it all up. What this means is that he is old, he is infirm, he is not able to keep himself warm at night, and he is sexually impotent. That's what that means. And that is all about his power to be king. So his sexual impotence is a symbol of his declining power to be king, which creates the crisis, which is why they have sent her in, figuring maybe she can get him through this crisis. Okay? What do you think? So, but it doesn't work. Which is going to create what? They can't... <coughs> <coughs> and that's lovely. They can't bring him back to life enough. So what do you think that's going to create? A vacuum. It's going to create the need for a new king. That's what's happening here. So now, Adonijah, whose mother was Haggis, put himself forward. This is Adonijah. Be careful with this thing. I don't have it clicked on yet, so I don't want to blind anybody. <laughs> I think I've sent a couple of people to the hospital already. So this is <laughs> this this is Adonijah right here. His mother is Haggith. So he steps forward. He puts himself forward. That's how the NIV translators put it. He put himself forward. So what does that mean? What happens in political seasons? In America. Chaos. <laughs> Chaos. That's quite an answer, Evie. Chaos. What happens is people put themselves forward, right? Ron DeSantis runs. Nikki Haley runs. These people all say, well, I'm going to run. They put themselves forward for the office. In this case, Adonijah is putting himself forward to be king. 
to be king. So verse 5, that, that all clear, all of this is important because it all matters to what's, what's going to be happening here. Verse 5, now Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, put himself forward and said, I will be king, me, 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 me. So he got chariots and he got horses ready with 50 men to run ahead of him. Who does that sound like? Think back a couple of months ago <coughs> in the book of Samuel. Who does that sound like? Absalom. That's Absalom, right? So Absalom, who had been, uh, I'll use current language, he had been dissed by his father, decided that what he would go down and do is he would ingratiate himself with all the people and he would settle disputes and he would ride around town with horses and men and his magnificent hair that weighed, I don't know what, 25 pounds or something it's blowing and it's he looks like one of those uh, um, uh, 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 Chanel for men commercials or something right so so that was Absalom so what is Adonijah doing he's the same thing he's a politician he's putting himself forward and he is acting the part so it's what is it like okay so I mean I don't want to make it too contemporary but I will so you remember about maybe four months ago or so when Gavin Newsom went to the White House and walked through the Rose Garden with the jacket over his back looking very presidential it's pretty much the same thing you want to look the part that you think you might want to play now Adonijah has declared himself he's put himself forward he says I'm that guy I'm ready to be king and uh, so, yeah. And notice he is, he is in the line of David's sons. He's not some outsider, right? Verse 6. Grandson, right? Son of no, son. son. See, David has, oh, you see all the, pe all the pink? Thank you, yes. That's all of David's women. Got it, got it. <laughs> and so he has all these children who are half-siblings. Verse 6, his father, that would be David, had never rebuked him by asking, why do you behave as you do? Which leads you to, with what impression? That added nice, was, I'm sorry, with what impression? He was not a hard man's father. He was, you're right, which we already know. We know from the book of Samuel that David tended to be very reticent about, you know, rebuking his sons and so we kind of might tell us that Elijah is kind of always been maybe a little bit out of control well, okay. right so and then we learned that Elijah was also very handsome right and was born next after Absalom <laughs> so the oldest Dave of David's son was Amnon. He's dead. Absalom, he murdered Amnon. Absalom is dead, caught in the tree with hair in the, his hair in the tree in battle and um, stabbed with a spear by whom? This is like quiz day. Joab. Y'all are so good. Very good. Joab. So now... The next in line is Adonijah. So it's not, it's not surprising that Adonijah puts himself forward as king. Now the fact that Adonijah would feel like he had to do certain things to be seen as king would indicate to us that they are not yet at the point where it's like an automatic thing, the eldest son gets the crown. And indeed, the eldest son won't get the crown. Because we know, even if you've only gone to Sunday school as a third grader, that Solomon becomes king. I think we learned that in third grade. Amnon, Chiliad, Chiliab. I don't know. 
Good question. That is a child. Okay, probably. Somebody will look it up right now for me. I know that. Okay, now, verse 7. Adonijah conferred with Joab, son of Zariah, and with Abiathar the priest, and they gave him their support. So he assembles a team. He's got a super pack. He is ready to go. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shammai, and Ray, and David's special guard did not join Adonijah. So now we have what? Multiple factions, right? We have the team that is ready to acknowledge Adonijah as the successor to David. And we have another team that is not ready to acknowledge Adonijah as successor. There's nothing automatic that's happening here. Mm, nope. Not yet. Okay. Nope. At, at a, verse 9. Yep. At verse, I'm sorry, what did you say? Anybody? <coughs> okay. I hear things now. <laughs> Probably through Andy's hearing aid. <laughs> verse 9. I, I, I only tease people I like, so. Okay, Patty's going to tell us about Chiliab. Uh, just on Wikipedia, <laughs> it says that uh, he may have died before his father and that later rabbinic traditions name him as one of the four ancient Israelites who died without sin. The other three being Benjamin, Jesse, and Amron. Huh. Well, okay, so, so Patty said she found out that they're, they, they're, you would guess that he died young, and then there's a rabbinic legends around him that say he was without sin along with four other, and three other ancestors. Well, just remember, those rabbinic legends are what? Legends. legends. They're just legends. They're just stories. So, so um, one of the ones that fascinates me the most comes out of the book of Joshua, where you meet a prostitute named Rahab. And um, she rescues and hides two Israelite spies who have come into Jericho in order to sort of scope it out before Joshua and the Israelites are going to take the city. And she does rescue them, and legends grow up around her. She's the most beautiful women, woman who ever lived. She, 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 be, she marries Joshua and all these things. So it's, it's just what people do. It's like, how did the wise men become, the magi become three? How did they get names? Same process. <coughs> <coughs> That's why you have, there's always work to be done biblically to separate that kind of stuff from what's actually in the Bible, because oftentimes our heads are filled with all that sort of legendary stuff. John, wasn't David about 70 when this happened? If he were to be about 70, when because it said he reigned 40, 40 years, years and reign. 40 years, and he probably spent most of his 20s running from Saul, but somewhere around there, which is a good long life. Yeah, <laughs> yeah a youngster. So verse 9, Adonijah then sacrificed sheep, he sacrificed cattle, he sacrificed fattened calves, calves that are really, you know, been fed well, prime, prime grade A beef, right? At the stone of Zoheleth near Enrogel, he invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaiah, or the special guard, or his brother Solomon. Now notice that Nathan, Benaiah, the special guard, they're listed as part of the faction that is not ready to support Adonijah. 
Solomon wasn't listed above, but he is, he's dissed here. He is not invited. Now, does all this strike you as Adonijah being a wise politician? Not me. Keep your, keep your friends close and your enemies closer, right? Isn't there something like that? Yeah. So then Nathan, in response to all these moves by Adonijah, asked Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king? At least he's taking it upon himself. And our Lord David knows nothing about it? Now then, let me advise you how you can save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Because what, she, what Nathan wants her to fear, maybe above all else, is that if Adonijah does succeed to the throne, he will eliminate all contenders, including Solomon and his mother Bathsheba. That is not, I mean, there's good reason for that. That's kind of how things worked in this world. So Nathan tells Bathsheba, go into King David and say to him, my lord the king, did you not swear to me, your servant? Surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Now, I don't think we've encountered that conversation between Bathsheba and, and David, but she's going to go in and tell him. You know, um, is she reminding him of something? Is she pretending to remind him of something? Did he make such a commitment to her? It, it, it's, it's interesting that she has regained her name. Remember one of the things we noticed about Bathsheba, that she was largely just Uriah's wife, the woman. Now she has regained her name here in the book of Kings. She is Bathsheba. Um, the, who gave birth. Is Solomon the first son to Bathsheba and David? No. No. David and Bathsheba had a son who died not too long after childbirth. And it was understood to have been punishment for David's sin. So Solomon was David and Bathsheba's second son. We're not told if there were daughters anywhere in this. That's just a fact of this world. But may perhaps second child, certainly second son. So she goes in. He wants Nathan to go in and say to David, Yes. No, this is Nathan, Nathan, a distant half-brother. The Nathan we have here is Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet is the one who went in and confronted David. Is it the, if it the same Nathan? He's really, really old now. Fourth son of I know, well, um, I wouldn't do that and don't ask me what the crosses make. So so I don't know. I don't know. The only reason I had this chart way back, this chart looks familiar, right? Was because of this and this. So you know what I'm gonna do with this chart? I'm gonna deep six it because I just noticed, I don't, I don't know what, I didn't do that. I don't know what the little. Okay. I don't know. I'm sick. I'm sick, people. Oh. All right. Why is that about now? There we go. Okay. But this is Nathan the prophet. Whether it is the same Nathan as confronted David after his sin with Bathsheba, I'm going to say yes. 
but I imagine there have been some arguments which would merely mean that David and Nathan are both old. Nathan's older, much older now like David was. But Nathan, as prophets go in the Old Testament, is a significant figure because he's God's prophet to David and the, his confrontation, bringing God's um, word about the consequences that will fall on David's household is a major moment there in 2 Samuel 12. And now Nathan is, um, he's with Bathsheba in this. Notice, y'all can help me here, that he isn't coming and saying, God told me to tell you this, right? Nathan has simply gone to Bathsheba and said, don't you know what Adonijah is doing? David doesn't know what, what, what Adonijah is doing. And you and your son Solomon are going to end up in big trouble. So I'll go back to the quote again. Surely Solomon, your son, should be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Why then has Adonijah become king? While you are still there talking to the king, I will come in and add my word to what you have said. So he's going to send her in, right? And then he's going to come in. This is, you know, yeah. They're trying to persuade David to act, who we know is frail and infirm and not the David that we knew in the book of Samuel. So Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room where Abishai, the Shunammite, was attending him. Bathsheba bowed down, prostrated herself before the king, and the king asked, what is it you want? And she said to him, My Lord, you yourself swore to me, your servant, by the Lord your God, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my Lord the king, do not know about it. He has sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves, and sheep and has invited all the king's sons Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army but he has not invited Solomon your servant my lord the king the eyes of all Israel are on you to learn from you who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him Otherwise, as soon as my lord, the king, is laid to rest with his ancestors, I and my son Solomon will be treated as criminals. And her fears are not unfounded. This is how it was done. The fact that she would sort of view this as a matter of life and death for her and Solomon is understandable. So Bathsheba's gone in to see David in his quarters. While she was still speaking with the king, verse 22, Nathan the prophet arrived. And the king was told, Nathan the prophet is here. So he went, Nathan went before the king and bowed with his face to the ground. Prostrate, that obeisance. Nathan said, have you, my lord the king, declared that Adonijah shall be king after you and that he will sit on your throne? Today he's gone down and sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves and sheep. He has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. Right now they are eating and drinking with him and saying, Long live King Adonijah. But me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon, 
he did not invite. Is this something my lord the king has done without letting his servants know who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So, it's a fair question. You know, I, Nathan wants to know if all of this has David's blessing. And Nathan just didn't know it. But of course, it's going to turn out that it doesn't. All right, so thoughts, reflections, questions, anything like that? <coughs> Before we go on, I don't want to miss anybody with my ready. <coughs> <coughs> okay, yes. Oh, they would all. They would all be very worried. Well, they could be, right? It. Well, it's really, it's really the sons of these women, who are who would be seen as the most troublesome because they might be contenders. Probably not the sons of the concubines, so much as the direct sons of David. It is like when. Saul is killed and Jonathan is killed that Saul's household flees the palace and little Mephibosheth, another son, uh, a son of Jonathan, in fact, is dropped. And remember, he, he injures himself. That Why are they fleeing? So that, so that Saul's successor doesn't come and kill them. It's a terrible thing, but it's kind of the way the ancient world often worked is that the new king would just get rid of the other contenders because they don't have any democratic processes that are supposed to work. Um, and so that this was their way. It's why poisonings, various as forms of assassination, all those things were so rampant in the ancient world. If you look at the history of the Caesars, I mean, they're dropping like flies, you know, from poisonings and other murders. And assass and it's because there was no way to get rid of them, except that way. So, anyway. Anything else? It's a wonderful Christmas story, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So, verse 28. So now Bathsheba's been in to make her pitch. Nathan's been in to make his pitch. And David, King David said in verse 28, Call in Bathsheba. So she came into the king's presence and she stood before him. And the king then took an oath. This is the oath. As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of every trouble... I will surely carry out this very day what I swore to you by Yahweh, the God of Israel. Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne in my place. So David makes this solemn oath before God that it will be Solomon. So let me ask you, do you think that seals the deal? No. no, of course it doesn't seal the deal. How happy is Adonijah going to be when he finds about the oath that David took? Not happy at all. He's, is he going to feel wronged? Of course he is. He is the next in line. I don't have that chart up anymore. <laughs> and I'm not putting it up. <coughs> he is next in line. If, if, if they had an ironclad tradition of primogeniture, he would be the successor to the throne, like Charles succeeding his mother. But they don't yet. And um, he would feel very wrong that it's going to come from this 
son of David's born in very, well, sort of sinful circumstances, you know, not good what happened with Bathsheba and Uriah and Solomon's sort of the product of all of that. And so Adonijah is going to feel very wronged. In addition, he seems to have been somebody who is ready to uh, take control. So the king has now taken the oath. The oath matters. Um, these oaths were taken very seriously. But it doesn't, settle, it doesn't settle things. So Bathsheba then bowed down with her face to the ground, prostrating herself before the king, and said, May my lord King David live forever. She, does, she, I mean, she knows he's not going to live forever, but it's a way of, of honoring David, and it, remember the promise in 2 Samuel 7, that one from David's line will sit on the throne of Israel all, at, all the way forward which is how you get all the way to Jesus who if he is going to be Messiah needs to have a claim to the throne of David because that was part and parcel of the job description yes Charlotte Any of those sons of David? yeah okay. yeah 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 I mean, they, 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 they're, all, they're all sons of David, yes. So that, but he's picked the one, right? You know, Scott, it's kind of cool, though, for Bathsheba. She has been basically, as you said, prior to this, she's always been called Uriah's wife or something like that. There has been no respect to her for all that she went through. But now she is willing to protect produces a son that is in the lineage of Christ. She's the mother of that child. It's, it's And, incredible. yes, Pat, Patty's saying, you know, now we sh now Bathsheba is this fully formed person. We're seeing her really full. And not only is she the mother of Solomon, she is the one who helps to make it all happen. Mm -hmm. Because she goes in and approaches David and says, you know, this is what you told me. You've got to make this happen. And Nathan then goes in and backs her up and says, you need to make this happen. So we see her. She has taken, oh, there's a fancy word people like to use now called agency. Agency is when you have the, the, the power to get something done. So she, we see her having agency in this to move things forward on her own. Right? And so it is good for Bathsheba. Be a lot of other women. It's a big thing. And isn't it, um, when you look, when you, uh, just, just take a moment. Okay, put a bookmark there. I will do the same thing. Put a bookmark there and go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Okay. So in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, you get this genealogy of Jesus that Arthur talked about for a bit on Sunday in his sermon. It's the chapter with all the begats. It's the chapter that a couple of times when I was a kid and got enthusiastic about reading the Bible, put a quick stop to it. So, so this genealogy, as Arthur noted on Sunday, is in three chunks three sections, each section being 14 people. Um, uh, 14 is twice seven. Seven's always significant. Um, these, this genealogy is not meant to be complete in that way. It is meant to tell the story and connect the past to the present, to connect Abraham to Jesus. And if you look down to verse 6, Oh, well, look up for a second. Oh, well, start at the beginning. Abraham, 
So this is the gene genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. What? Matthew 1, verse 1. Matthew 1, verse 1. This is the genealogy of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. How many total between Judah and his brothers? Twelve, Twelve very good. Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now that is a fascinating story in the book of Genesis chapter 38. She basically tricks Judah into having her father-in-law, ex-father-in-law, her husbands have died, into having sex with her and so that she could give birth to a son or sons who will take care of her because Judah had not fulfilled his responsibility. He was afraid of her. He was afraid that she was like a black widow, killing off every husband she had. It's a great story. But see, she's in the genealogy of Jesus, and she's a woman, which is like shocking, first of all. Second, she's a woman shrouded in a bit of, you know, like scandal. That's the word I've been looking for, scandal. So, Judah, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez, the father of Hezron. Hezron, the father of Ram. Ram, the father of Aminadab. Aminadab, the father of Nashon. Nashon, the father of Salmon. Salmon, the father of Boaz. That's a name I know from the book of Ruth. Whose mother was Rahab. Well, who's Rahab? Rahab's a prostitute from Joshua chapter 2. So she, she was the mother of Solomon. Uh, the book of Ruth is set during the time of the judges, so it all fits. Solomon, verse 5, Solomon, the father of Boab, whose mother was Rahab. Okay? Boaz, the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth. You're right, so Rahab would be Boaz's. He would be Salmon's wife. Huh? Well, whatever. <laughs> because the, the legend, if you care about those things, is that she married Joshua. But anyway, we'll put that aside. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. So let me ask you a question. So now we have Tamar. We have Rahab. We have Ruth. All these women named in Jesus' genealogy. Is Ruth an Israelite? No. She wasn't. She's not an Israelite. She does not have the blood of Abraham flowing through her veins. She's a Moabite. <laughs> but she becomes an Israelite. When she tells her mother-in-law, Naomi, that I will go where you go, your people will be my people, she, your God, will be my God. And she is in the line of Jesus, in the line of David. Because Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. There she is, but she loses her name again. No respect. But she is the fourth woman, and she too is a woman who is in a bit of scandal, right? So it's endlessly fascinating that these four women are in the genealogy and they all have some scandal attached to them. So, Solomon the father of Rehoboam. Someday, on Tuesday, you will meet Rehoboam. He was, he was an idiot. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam, the father of Abijah, Abijah, the father of Asa, Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram, Jehoram, the father of Uzziah, Uzziah, the father of Jotham, Jotham, the father of Ahaz, Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. He was a bad man, Manasseh. Ba Hezekiah was a good king. Manasseh was a bad man. Manasseh, the father of Ammon, Ammon, the father of Josiah, a good king. 
and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the exile to Babylon. That is the first set of genealogy, and then there's two more, and at the end of it you come to Jesus. Go to, go to verse 15. Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. So Mary is the fifth woman, actually listed in the genealogy, and Mary, too, has some scandal attached to her, doesn't she? Because she shows up pregnant when she's engaged to Joseph. That's not, that's, that's not how it's supposed to work. So all five of those women have some scandal attached to them, and yet all five of these women are listed in Jesus' Jesus's genealogy. So it, it is ripe for good biblical preaching about the place of the part that women play alongside men in God's redemptive plan. And can, you, can you second that, Lauren? Amen. Amen. Makes sense. What what doesn't always make sense? Some of these crazy rat trails that go on, but God God God's controlling it all. But it doesn't make sense logically. Well, sometimes the way the world works, and sometimes it's hard for us to discern God's purposes. We could have another talk about. We could have a talk another day about whether God actually controls everything that happens. Because for me, if God controls everything that happens, then Auschwitz was part of God's plan, or October 7th. I, I can't get there. So it leads me to different thoughts about the way that God works in this world. But there we go. Okay, so, my friends, that's wild. So now, I'm still not putting that chart up, so don't ask. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. Okay, so First Kings. Oh, where are you? Oh, it's right before Second Kings. All right. Back to First Kings. So David makes this oath to to God, right? That's that's who the oath is to. And he's making this oath to God that he is, that it will be Solomon who succeeds him. And Bathsheba thanks him and blesses him. And verse 32. Now, David may be frail, and he may be sexually impotent, and all of that is supposed to generally point to his general impotence, his inability to fully function as king, but he's not an idiot. So he knows that, that there is some work to be done to make this, to put this into effect. So King David said, call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada. These are leaders in the anti-Adonijah faction. When they came before the king, he said to them, Take your Lord's servants with you, and have Solomon my son mount my own mule, and take him down to Gihon. That's an important place in the history of Israel. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. So now what we have is we have Adonijah running around, and he's got his faction, and he's got his men, and he's got his horses. And the king says, take Solomon down to Gihon, and you guys are going to anoint him king. And he's going to ride my mule, the king's mule. Again, I'm just struck by the fact that it's a mule and not a horse. Because, you know, I've seen Game of Thrones. What do kings ride? Horses. 
not mules, but what does, what does, David, what does Jesus ride into Jerusalem? Not a war steed, not a conquering horse, not a mighty horse dressed in battle armor. He rides a donkey, a colt, something like that. So there have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anointed him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon! Then you are to go up with him, and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. Okay, so those words, Israel and Judah, are again, they are a signpost. This is written after the fact, edited after the fact, that they signpost to what is coming, which will be the division of the tribes into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. If that never happened, he wouldn't say over Israel and Judah. He would just simply say over the tribes, over Israel, whatever. But here, you, like we've seen before, you get, this, you get this Israel and Judah. So Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen! May Yahweh, the God of my lord the king, so declare it. And as Yahweh was with my lord the king, so may he be with Solomon to make his throne even greater than the throne of my lord King David. Okay. So, Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehida, the Carathites, the Pelophites, went down and had Solomon mount King David's mule, and they escorted him to Gihon. Is Gihon on my little map here? <coughs> no, not on this one. It's near Jerusalem. Okay. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet, and all the people shouted, Long live Solomon. And all the people. Went up after him, playing pipes and rejoicing greatly, so that the ground shook with the sound. So what is being depicted for us? Everybody's excited. Everybody's with Solomon. He's been anointed by a priest and a prophet and announced and the trumpets have sounded, and he's riding the king's mule, and everybody's so excited, and now he's heading up to Jerusalem, and wow, wow, it's a, like a big, in our world, it would be like this giant political rally with huge crowds following, you know. It's kind of, it's kind of like everybody is, is escorting, um, it's kind of like the inauguration, maybe, right? Big crowds, big excitement. Lots of inaugural balls. Um, because it's presumably going to be Solomon. Now what does, what does all this mean for Adonijah? He's in trouble. Does it say some of the people went with Solomon? It says all the people. How many times does it say all the people? At least twice. Maybe another one, another one snuck in there. But at least twice, all the people, all of the people, they're so excited. There's so much sound. Wow. So, whew. now, this, this thing's a little reminiscent of Absalom, right? Because Absalom threw a party. And Adonijah's throwing a party. Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they were finishing their feast. On hearing the sound of the trumpet, Joab asked, Well, what's the meaning of all that noise in the city? What's happening? We've been sitting here drinking and feasting, eating royal beast and having a wonderful time. What's happening? We're, what, 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 what? Even as he was speaking, Jonathan 
son of Abiathar, the priest arrived, and Adonijah said, Come in, a worthy man like you, you must be bringing us good news. Don't you love this? I mean, this writing is thousands of years old. Yet it's, it's, it's pretty captivating, isn't it? Come in, a worthy man like you must be bringing good news. And Jonathan answered, not at all. <laughs> Our Lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Kerasites, the Pelethites, and they have put him on the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon. From there they have gone up cheering and the city resounds with it. That's the noise you hear. Moreover, Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne. Also, the royal officials have come to congratulate our Lord King David saying, May your God make Solomon's name more famous than yours and his throne greater than yours. And the king bowed and worshipped on his bed and said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. And you can imagine Adonijah going, oh, We are so screwed. <laughs> right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, somebody might say to Adonijah, well, you know, it's great you had a party and a feast, you know, for you and your friends, but you, just, you took your eye off the ball. You know, you were so sure because you're so handsome, so good looking, and you had your 50 men and your horses and all that, and you had a few guys on your side, including Joab. Joab, I wouldn't want on my side. Remember, Joab is a duplicitous murderer, but he, uh, he did, took his eye off the ball, didn't keep an eye on things, and now he's surprised it's all done. It's like this done thing, and now Adonijah, he's probably drunk, <laughs> Pro right? Probably, this is the feast. What kind of feast would it be if these guys weren't drinking too much? Well, verse 49, at this, all Adonijah's guests rose in alarm. And they dispersed, which is a very nice Hebrew way of saying they ran for their lives. But Adonijah, in fear of Solomon, went and took hold of what? The horns of the altar. So he makes his way to the tabernacle because the temple has not been built. He makes his way, and there he finds these horns on the altar. And what this is, the, the tradition here is that if you are holding these horns, it is like sanctuary. If you have these horns, it's like sanctuary. Um, sanctuary is a real interesting Old Testament idea because there in the Old Testament, there are a lot of, laws about people being punished even with death um, even if it's something that you and with murder for sure but even if it's something like like that you and I would call manslaughter maybe like an accident but there's still a death and it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and so there there's a provision made for it and there that there are some sanctuary cities some sanctuary towns set up where if the person goes there they are protected from suffering the pain of death. And here, this is what the holding, taken hold of the altars, of the horns of the altar are all about. So Solomon was told, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon and is clinging to the horns of the altar. So Solomon's sitting on the throne or doing something like that, and they bring him word that Adonijah has grabbed these horns for dear life. Right? And Adonijah says, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. 
That's what he wants. He wants a promise from the king that he will be okay. So Solomon replied, if he shows himself to be worthy, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground. But if evil is found in him, he will die. Then King Solomon sent men, and they brought him down from the altar. And Adonijah came and bowed down to King Solomon. And Solomon says what? Go to your home. In most ancient cultures, at this point, you would have expected Adonijah to pay with his life. But he does not. At this moment, go to your home. So, in the good tradition of a cliffhanger, we are going to leave it there for, for next week. Okay? And, um, yes, sir. Jesus' claim through Joseph yeah. is a legal one. Okay. It's like... But not a biological Not a biological one. Which is kind of a teaching point for the Israelites. That it's really not about biology. You don't have to have the blood of Abraham in your veins to be a proper worshiper of Yahweh and be devoted to Yahweh even though... In Jesus' day, many Jews had a strong sense of ethnic privilege. Um, and so Paul was working against that, against that a lot. And that's why I like the example of Ruth being a Moabite, but it is that legal claim. It's the same way in our world it would be somebody who was adopted, would have a complete and utter legal claim alongside the, the DNA blood siblings, to the parents' estate or whatever it was because in the law, adopted sons and daughters are exactly the same, no difference between them and um, the natural born sons and daughters. It's like a lot of people don't realize that Julius Caesar, who um, the, the first, it is not his blood relative, Octavian, who becomes the first emperor of Rome, it is his nephew who was adopted by Caesar, who becomes the first emperor of, of Rome. So, good question. All right, friends, anything else before we pack it in? Yes, sir. Benaiah? That, that, that would be your Benaiah. In the snow pit? You are fascinated by that story, aren't you? Yes, it would be that guy. It would be that guy, right? Sure. He's old now because he was with David and all the fighting, so he's old like David is old, but he's still that guy. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to pray. And then Lauren is going to make an announcement about the Stations of the Cross. Okay, so would you pray with me? Gracious Lord, wow. You know, this writing in the, comes to us from so long ago. And it obviously that the Israelites and the Jews took great care with it and knew how to tell <coughs> this story in a way that is engaging and, and captivating. And we are further captivated when we remember that this is the story of your people in life with you, Lord. It is our story, for we are descendants of this people, not, not, not by blood necessarily, but by our devotion to you and our faith in Jesus Christ. And we pray all this in his name. Amen.